Uh, right, got it. Uh, so uh, let me tell you that um, there are some people who may not want you to see this presentation, so much so that on uh, my first night in San Francisco, uh, the uh, laptop which contained this presentation was stolen from my car, which was broken into and uh, oh. window shattered. By the board. But luckily, <laughs> luckily the, uh, the it was in the cloud, and so you guys still mm -hmm. get to hear it. So how do you have the company survive as board of directors? Um, so let me start with three short stories, okay? The first is a story about uh, a company that was beating Google at its own main revenue generating game of uh, paid search. Uh, it was growing at triple digit percentage per quarter. Um, and then a board of directors decided to intervene. So the funny things about a board of directors of a fast growing company is it's a little bit like uh, being a co-pilot in a race car. You don't have control of the steering wheel. You don't have control of the gas or the uh, or the, uh, uh, the brakes. You just have this one button, and that button is the eject seat for the pilot. Okay, <laughs> that's the one thing you can do. And so you can't kind of drive, you know, and you're you know going here and, there. and at some point you're like, I, I gotta try something. I got, I want to do something, and they press that eject button and see what happens. And guess what happens <coughs> most of the time when you press the eject button? Uh, the pilot in a fast moving car. So this is what this board uh, decided to do and ended up uh, with a, a new pilot or CEO that uh, lied to the board and the board said, I don't care if he lies. And, and soon after the company uh, was sold uh, with 100% white pipe of common on the majority of shareholders value and 97% uh, decrease in the value of the firm. The next story is uh, about a company that <clears throat> for over a decade grew every month and every year, year over year, over 50% a year. It won 10 or more than 10 awards at the national and global level. It impacted the lives of hundreds of millions of people positively. Um, and uh, then again, one day the board decided to press that really tempting button. And they pressed the button and they got a CEO that uh, embezzled money then they decided to keep the CEO that embezzled money after discovering he had embezzled money, and it led to a 100% wipeout of this uh, uh, shareholder value from the majority of shareholders, okay? Loss of the biggest customers, loss of the, many of the best employees, et cetera. So loss of lives impacted. Third story uh, is about a director of the board who was uh, consistently caught playing Minesweeper at the uh, company uh, headquarters, and that's what he did all day. Uh, and um, it, that, uh, that company soon thereafter uh, was delisted from the uh, public uh, listed uh, stock exchanges uh, and laid off 30% of its staff, okay? So the question is, how do these things happen and how do we avoid them? So, the common, common thread about these were overconfident professional investors in the board of directors and uh, pushover non-CEO directors. So if you think, oh, this just happens in you know bad companies and that works, well, Steve Jobs, of course, had this happen to him, okay? So it can happen to the best of us. Okay. Um, some of you may or may not know that Jeff Bezos had this almost happen to him. Uh, there's this fascinating story in this uh, great book called The Trillion Dollar Coach. Uh, about the coach that saved Jeff Bezos. Uh, Jeff Bezos is Amazon's directors wanted to do this to Jeff, and somebody had the common sense of bringing in a coach to just double check that assumption, and the coach uh, decided that Jeff should stay, and the rest is history. So to understand the impact of venture capital and board composition on firm outcome, I analyzed data specifically for this talk. This is original research for this talk, presented for the very first time. Uh, I analyzed data from 751,757 companies. Wow. <laughs> Uh, only 19.1% of those companies are venture-backed, so you think this is a very august and very lucky select group, you might think. So it turns out that uh, venture-backed companies get seven times the funding per company versus non-venture-backed, so that sounds like it's really good, right? You mean you'd want to have seven times more money, you think, than not. And yet, more venture-backed companies die than go public, okay? And I picked dying, uh, as in through literally shutting down <coughs> and going public, because those are the unambiguously good or bad outcomes, right? There, you know, the, the M&A outcomes, there's some really great M&A outcomes, there's some terrible ones, it's, it's, it's just harder and messier. But these are unambiguous, uh, and so you're gonna see green is good, went public, and black is dead, you know, gone dead, okay? So that's 13,145 companies dead after receiving $128.25 billion in total funding, okay? And yet that happens despite three times more non-venture-backed companies go public than die. 
Okay. Again, more venture-backed companies die than go public, despite on the among the non-venture-backed companies, three times as many go public as die. Okay. So venture-backed companies are 351% more likely to die than non-venture-backed ones. Digest that. Mm -hmm. Even though companies with more money, because you, you want to try to dissect it, is, is it the money? Is it the money? Well, no. Companies with more money in this particular graph is uh, companies that receive uh, more than $100 million worth of funding were 244% more likely to IPO and 64% less likely to die. All other things equal, right? So these mm -hmm. are, uh, they, they both had ser in, in this is Series A only. Mm -hmm. so, so in this case, it's not venture versus not venture. They both got venture, they got just a Series A. When got the ones that got money did better. So money per se is not the source of all evil. So what is it? And by the way, corporate funded companies are 364% more likely to IPO than to die, as long as no VC is involved. <laughs> okay? Out of VC, venture backed corporate funded companies <clears throat> are 193% more likely to go public than the non-venture-backed ones, but 712% more likely to die, okay? More generally, venture-backed companies are 30% more likely to go public. So there is, a, there is an improvement in the, the, that IPO success rate for venture-backed, 30%, a modest improvement, but 351% more likely to die than non-venture-backed companies. So, this brings me to uh, this painting of uh, King Solomon and his famous uh, uh, judgment where two women uh, who claim to be the mother of the same child appear to him for, uh, for a, a verdict of what to do. And Solomon famously said, well, we'll just split the baby in two. Yeah. And as is well known, the true mother said, no, 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 just save him, give him to, to her. I want to save this life rather than have him live with me. And of course, uh, the King Solomon said, okay, that's the true mother, give it to her. What we need, one of the things we need is an effective process of Solomonic judgment of divorces. When are these, so what happens, right? So VC companies are swinging for the fences, VC funds, and they're trying to get to that 30% greater IPO change. And when a company somehow gets deemed to not be the, the favorite candidate to get there, it gets killed you know, at, at that massively higher rate. And just like the, the, the woman who is not the mother, right? And what the VCs ought to do is they ought to be like the true mother who say, you know what, I'm no longer involved. I don't no longer interested. Founder, take it over. Mm -hmm. Take it over. We don't need to kill it just because it's not going to make IPO in my judgment right now. Okay? That's the Solomonic pledge. We'll get to that. The Solomonic pledge is I will not invest in funds that in funds that don't pledge to proxy their shares to founders before killing a company, <laughs> which is a significantly a very, very uh, common event. Now. Interestingly, if you, you know, the, what does a venture capitalist do for a living? You sort of <coughs> allocate capital. The average venture capitalist wastes a higher percentage of capital. So it's not just about like picking the winners. Wastes a higher percentage of capital than backers of non-venture back companies. So almost 15% of capital from VC back companies is wasted on companies that end up dead uh, versus uh, less than 10% among the non-venture back companies wasted there. So why do these VC-backed companies die 351% more often? Companies are, of course, ruled by the board of directors. People tend to think, oh, it's CEOs who uh, rule companies. No, it's not CEOs, uh, it's board of directors. And so board composition really matters. Now, when you fly in a plane, you probably wouldn't dream of having the plane flown by the person who got the money to buy the plane. You want a pilot. And when you want the part operated on, you probably don't want the person who secured the funds to build the hospital to be operating on your heart. You want to enter it. So why this, this has this specialization of labor that has reached most areas of the economy mm. not reach board of directors yet? Most important job of a board of directors is evaluating, hiring, and firing a CEO. And so in my personal experience, 100% of the blunders I have made by and seen by non -ex, I have seen made by non-executive directors were made by non-CEOs. So my hypothesis, wild hypothesis, was well, perhaps the best qualification to evaluate a CEO is to be or have been a CEO. Maybe it helps to know someone, to uh, to you know, to be someone, to to, to know someone. And so to test that hypothesis, I carried out comparison. <clears throat> On the one hand, I looked at the 10 companies that had raised the most amount of money. These are the Airbnbs of the world. Companies that have raised you know, huge amounts of money would not have gotten there without being successful. 
collectively, they raised over $50 billion. And on the other hand, I looked at all the startups that shut down last quarter, okay, died. On the left are the 10 companies that raised the most money, and on the right are the companies that failed. You can see that the percentage of CEOs in the boards of the successful companies are more than twice, like more than 250% in the, the number of CEOs uh, in the in boards of the companies that failed. Mm -hmm. And conversely, the percentage of investors, uh, professional investors, people who dedicated their life to manage other people's money, uh, as opposed to any kind of operating role, like that make or legal, they they are uh, more than you know, or about twice as the, about many uh, the number of investors and boards of the successful companies. Okay, if you look at the most successful of the companies of all, so the, the half of most successful, that, that that's even more so of a trend. Seventy-five percent of the of the uh, boards mm -hmm. there, the most successful companies, are CEOs. So indeed, it seems that it helps to have been one to be able to recognize one. And yet, nearly two thirds of board seats filled last year were taken by someone other than a CEO. That's data from Point Ferry. So this, so what I just showed you today is contrary to the common wisdom of what people are doing today in companies uh, around the country and the world. Now let me clarify that this doesn't mean that every investor is uh, is, is a bad thing to a company, right? You just have to know what you're doing if you want to be in the board part of it. It doesn't mean that there's not a role for people raising money, which is a, you know, a completely different kind of job than running a company. Uh, and so this brings me to my second pledge, which is the professional director's pledge. I will not invest in companies or funds that have people who are only professional investors as directors. Okay? Division of labor. Mm -hmm. And so how do, how do we implement this? Uh, simple with a pledge or a rider to professionalize the board. For example, this fund will only appoint idoneous directors of the board, or this company will only accept idoneous directors of the board. Entrepreneurs must demand it, limited partners must demand it because clearly the returns are better, and investors should realize that returns are better with professional CEO directors. So to finish, I will <laughs> talk about training, right? So in order to become a surgeon, uh, you need 13 or 14 years of training. In order to become an airline pilot, you need about six years of training. Guess how much training you need to become a director of the board, ruling over a corporation that determines the lives, livelihoods of thousands of employees, thousands of customers, millions of users potentially. Nothing, zilch. No training required whatsoever, okay? And I think that needs to change. So I actually wrote a book uh, upcoming soon called 25 Letters You Can't Afford to Make as a Director, how to have the company survive its board. Uh, subtitle, which was actually given to me by uh, Natalia Anway, so thank you for that. Uh, and so the, 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 the gist is, you know, ensure that only qualified uh, directors serve on boards, right? So boards really matter. They hire, fire CEOs, they make or break companies. Specialization of labor really works. And so the best qualification to hire, evaluate, and fire CEO is having been a CEO. Being an investor, per se, is no qualification to serve on a board. Investors who lose interest in a company should give a proxy to the founders rather than kill it. And board of directors need to receive training. Bad boards abound. VC-backed companies are doing worse than non-VC-backed ones at survival, which is a pretty <coughs> important thing to do. Uh, and every job is learned, so let's teach our directors to be directors. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.